Are we ready to show? Yep. We're going to call the meeting to order. Please join us for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening and welcome, everybody. We're glad you're here. Um, we're going to start out by um, accepting the motion and second to approve the agenda. I so will. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Again, same sign. That motion passes. Um, moving on, it's our open forum portion, but we have no one signed up for open forum tonight. So we'll go on to communications, and our Director of Business Services, Robin Bosford Ferguson, will give us her report. Thank you, Madam Chair, and members of the board. There are two reports out there, but we're going to just talk about the January one. We didn't. When we were here in January, I didn't have a December report for you because it was a little soon in the month. So they're both out there for you, but we'll just talk about January. Um, but if you want to look back at that as well, you can. Um, in our general fund, we're at about 47% compared to last year at 54 and the year before 44. The reason last year was much higher was because of those capital projects that we had. And you can see that in there. Um, food, in food service and in community service, our expenses are up on both of them, but also our revenue is up. So they're matching everything on there pretty well. Any questions on this report? Nothing wrong with anything on that. <coughs> so Robin, I just had a question about certain sure. services. So being yeah. that meals are free this year, mm -hmm. what overall, not numbers wise, but what overall impact has that had on our budget? Uh, because we're getting state and federal funding instead of um, parents paying for the meals, it's, it's actually more revenue coming in. Okay. And there's more kids eating because it's free. Yeah. So our numbers are going up that way, so we're getting more federal and state um, reimbursement. Thank you. Yeah, um, the other report I have is the enrollment, and this isn't going up. <laughs> this is actually going down. We are down actually 72 over budget, which the, the green line is where we're at this year. It's kind of hoping we're going to follow that gray one as we did last year and can't start going up, but right now we're continuing to go down. So we'll keep an eye on that. Um, as we go into our revised budget planning. Any other questions for me? Thank you. Thanks, Robin. All right, we'll move on to board committee updates. Were there any committee happenings that you wanted to update the rest of the board on for anyone out there? We have a tentative agreement with Clem, so that was a big step. <coughs> We had a C meeting, and uh, Brian was there, and Lori and Sarah and I. And uh, they always have really wonderful speakers. I thought they were really interesting to listen to. And is it Boyce Olson? You'll hear him on WCCO radio, and he gives a kind of like a, a, a legislative update quite often on there. I just heard him again not too often, but he's uh, quite a re uh, renowned uh, person as far as uh, understanding the political climate of Minnesota. And if you ever get a chance to hear him on CCO, he is really good. And that's one of the things I do enjoy about that. Um, he's named one of 100 Minnesotans you should know for 2023. And uh, one of the things he said that I'm kind of constantly as a board member, and this is going to take a little bit of time, so I'm sorry, but I just think it's important. One of the stories he's told, and in all respect, you know, Mr. Dietz, about um, the comments that he had about, he, had, he, he was just thinking about uh, being a parent and how he would call board members and he would say, uh, hey, can you tell me? I, I have no really complaints about it, but I just want to know. I want some information, kind of how the curriculum got changed or how did this decision come about? And the comment was typically that the superintendent kind of decided that. And, um, and he, he did this several times. And he finally said to the board member, you know, we elect you. You are on the ballot. The superintendent isn't on that ballot. But one of the things I appreciate, Brian, is you including us on all those things, because there are oftentimes we get asked questions about things, and an I don't know is really not a good answer. And especially when things occur sometimes and something happens, we go, I didn't hear about that. But Brian, I, I just thank you for letting us know. I mean, we're I can hardly keep up sometimes with the emails, and I'm sure you as well. But I do think that's important for us to remember as board members. You know, I'm always struggling with what action should I take? Uh, what's my role? Uh, 
Am I a support on this particular topic? Am I a champion of it? Am I supposed to be doing something? I certainly think I should be knowledgeable about those things. And then my, our lines often as board members, where are our lines start and stop? And, and so we're kind of constantly trying to figure that out and evolve. And I think the role of board members has probably changed quite a bit in the last five years, pre-COVID to, to now as well. So I don't know where you folks are on that, but I think it's uh, something I think we're constantly kind of talking about and asking ourselves about. So I hope that maybe we'll have a, a better line of demarcation of where those lines are as we try to figure this out. And going through uh, cuts right now too, we're all kind of asking ourselves questions and then once in a while we talk to each other and we're trying to figure out you know, what, what is our part in all of this. And obviously we all prove those things, so it's really important I think for us to kind of understand where those things come. And then <clears throat> the second speaker was Adash Unia. He's the primary liaison between the state legislature and the Minnesota Department of Ed. Well, that's a kind of important job. And he, you know, I wouldn't say he was exciting to listen to, but it was interesting his role and kind of some of the topics that school board members have and kind of as far as funding, especially coming out of this big legislative session, all the money that was there. And, and yet we know all the earmarks and the requirements and everything else with it. So there was a lot of questions. On that one of the most pertinent ones we are doing this reading program and yet there's only a few people that provide the reading training well they felt like they were creating a monopoly of who could who could give that training and one of those things that happen in legislation the uh collateral damage or the collateral of things that get affected by decisions that are made that are not always preflected through so it's kind of interesting to listen to maybe a board's perspective after a legislative session of what happened the interesting thing about that, he came from Willow Creek Middle School in Rochester, and that's where my son teaches seventh and eighth grade English, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And he went to Bamber Valley Elementary School, and my three grandchildren go to school in Bamber Elementary School, so I did want to talk to him about that. But what, it, what was interesting is they remember him going through, and I think ourselves, you know, sometimes we go into the schools and you look around, Paul, oh, our kids are in the rudimentary stages of becoming these people that come and speak to us and, and do wonderful things. I mean, we Josh is a former student. He went through all of the education here, and now he's sitting on the board. I think that's kind of a remarkable thing. And, and we have kids and nieces and nephews that go through our schools, and I think it's an important thing to remember. The things that we do and train, and we got some, we got some very incredible people. I spent today um, in the choir room. We had a good day, I think. It was really a fun day. Um, but it's just kind of, I guess, a reminder back to the important things of what we do and why we're doing those types of things. Hey, and Earl, then, we'll give you a chance to evaluate Mr. Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, let's have a public evaluation here. Just thumbs up. Just give me a, a formative assessment is good enough for me. But, um, also, you have in your packet some information that came out of SEED, some more information that compares Chisau Lakes with the other districts, mm -hmm. which I think is very pertinent. I hope you take a look at it. It's really interesting. And then you also have with you a chart that Jen created with all of the levies that were put out, and I think it really puts it and shows where Chisau Lakes is, and, mm -hmm. and you can see the placement of where we are. And then a third thing I hear is there's some tax liability that I did some comparisons in our county, our township that are in our school district, as well as um, the city taxes the last four years, and some uh, on uh, some uh, funding information as well. And it's it's kind of in its starting stages, and I think you're going to see more on this. But it kind of shows that there's a not a lot of margin probably for people to pay more taxes. And, they don't necessarily come from the school, but it is factual data-driven information. I think it'll be just helpful for the city kind of where we are. And a lot of our residents have two or three of those at least. They either live in the city and the county, obviously, or the township county. So, all right, I'm done for a while. Thanks, Joe. Were there any other committees that met that maybe they need to give a report? If not, we'll move on to the superintendent update. Superintendent Dietz, what have you got for us tonight? Well, I'm going to start with student-centered first. Um, today was a really great day. We had an opportunity to honor a lot of our programs that have made accomplishments and going to stay at this point. So um, we have dance, alpine skiing, DECA, EPA. They all had an opportunity to do the 
walk through the hallways and be honored for the work they've done and where they're going to stay as well. And when I was driving over to see the gymnastics section tonight that's uh, at the high school, I saw the parade come by with the dance team going to states. I just think it's just a good reminder that there's a lot of great things happening. We've got good schools. We've got great kids. So I had to hear them tonight a little bit as well. But I mean, just a lot of good things going on. It's just always, it's, it makes you feel good when you see students thriving. So I just thought it was a good starting point what I want to talk about tonight. Uh, session, obviously getting kicked off. They're expected to be six weeks. And everything we're hearing from our lobbyists is going to be a pretty quiet session for education. There's a number of interests. And normally the off year is more of a bonding bill type of year. But I think more and more we're just hearing that, again, there might be some things that might be lobbed up. It might just be more to tease and maybe for the next biennium. But I think that, again, as we keep hearing things, it's just not a great appetite for things. And part of it probably because they are seeing that next year there will be a deficit of what they're projecting. So I think they're trying to prepare for that piece as well. But we'll keep on that and talk to our lobbyists and see what we can do to, to again, get that piece of information out, the, the story of education as well. Um, first newsletter is coming out here in the next few months. Um, that's something that's been really big for us too, is how we have our opportunities to make an imprint in our communities and tell our stories. So we're working on that as we speak. It'll be a nicer collection of stories about our sites, our programs, our students, and it'll go out to every taxpayer in our district. And uh, look for that to happen about three to four times a year, including that back to school edition as well. Try to get some lofty goals, but feel it's important for us to have that earmarked and get out to our community so they can learn a bit more about us as well and our story. Um, Tonight's going to be really fun. You have an opportunity to meet with Nexus Solutions tonight. Um, we'll be looking at the agreement, but um, just appreciate their, their partnership and being here tonight. This is an opportunity for us to really take a deep dive into our buildings, bring people and experts that can look and help us to identify what really is going on, what our priorities are, and come back in the next four months with a comprehensive plan that we can point to as a directional piece for our district. So. Um, I appreciate them being here tonight and the opportunity to get to know you guys a little bit more because it is a partnership. It's a family. And I think that's a really important part is to find partners that are going to walk with you the entire journey. And that's something that Nexus will do with us as well. Uh, stay of the district addresses. So we started a new tradition this year and uh, we already had two that we've done last week. Um, and basically, that's just an opportunity for us to go out and talk to our staff about who we are, where we're going and what we want them to know about our district so we can move forward together. And that work together has been really important for me. So I think that's a piece that we're trying to bring back to that forefront that again, we all march together, we all support each other. So we've had two presentations thus far for Rob and myself. We have three more <laughs> next week at all of our elementary schools. So if you haven't heard or you want to hear it a second or third or fourth or fifth time, it's riveting information for 30 great minutes. We're rushing through stuff, but <laughs> here's a nice part. And I will say this, and I appreciate this from our staff. The conversations after we're done presenting, <clears throat> the emails I've received afterwards as well, is just more of that piece of twofold. One, thank you for sharing some stuff that I just didn't know. It seems a little simpler to me now that I can maybe understand this. And our goal is to come back on every year and get some of these common themes to educate our staff. And the second piece is more importantly just the opportunity for us to just talk. So we're out there actually putting ourselves out there to say, we want to be a partner with you. We want to work with you moving forward. And, the only way this is going to happen for us to be successful is we do it together. So I think that was a really, uh, it's been nice so far, and I'm looking forward to the last three next week. And we'll do some other ones for other groups that might have missed it as well, too. So last, this is out of the presses tonight. Um, I wanted to take a moment to recognize Eric Simmons, our uh, technology director. He is being recognized by Mass, which is our school association for ministers in Minnesota as a 2024 Outstanding Central Office Leader in Greater Minnesota. So I had a chance to stop by today. Lily got an email, I walked by his office, I stopped, told thanks and congratulations, and just proud of him for the work he does and he's recognized by the state as well. Thanks, that's fine. Just having been at a couple of your state of the district addresses, they've been very well received, Robin and Brian, and really the staff have appreciated them. So even though I know you feel like you're saying the same words over and over again and trying to be, make it short and sweet, they've been well received. People appreciate the information, so thank you. And then, can I just ask, I don't see a chance for a student update. Can I add them in there? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Hi, Dave. Nice Hi. to see you. Do you have anything new to share with the board tonight? Um, like Superintendent Deet said, we did have a walking pep test today for the state dance, uh, both jazz and kick, 
Alpine skiing, I believe, was last week. I believe they had their state meet or earlier this week. Um, and then there was the DECA, BPA, and then I walked with Eleanor because I'm headed to All State Choir tomorrow. Um, and then our band, the Wind Ensemble, had their uh, <coughs> contest last uh, on Tuesday and they got superior ratings for that. Um, the choir has, the select choir has a concert next Saturday, the 24th. Uh, it's called Sing Two. Uh, it's paired with uh, a local choir called Unexpected Company. Um, we've got four other participating schools as well, and it's gonna be hosted in the high school main gym at 4.30. We weren't able to do it last year because they asked us very last minute and it was not enough time to prepare. So this is our first year really um, participating in this. Otherwise, I believe that's all I have to say. Well, that's a lot. Thank you very much. Anybody else have any questions for Gabe? Or... Well, thanks for being here. All right, we will move on to the district literacy update. Um, Sarah Schmidt is going to wherever you'd like to be, Sarah. Okay, so thank you for the opportunity. I wanted to give an update on how we are implementing the science of reading. Um, and I don't know, Michelle, are you my clicker? Yep. Okay, we're going to. Okay, see you for the next one. <laughs> so, as you may have heard, the Minnesota uh, passed legislation called the READ Act last year, and there are several components. We can go through it. So, July 1st. By July 1st, you have to have a plan to train teachers, and they approved three different trainings that you can do letters, core, or carryall. Um, and then by school year 25, districts have to screen students twice a year on certain literacy measures. Um, the approved measures are Dibbles and Fastbridge. And then this January, they had to release what the approved curriculum are that all districts have to use. And I'm happy to report that we are, we are in alignment and ahead of the game in all those areas. So we already have teachers trained, we already have the screening measures, and we already have a curriculum that's been approved. So. I wanted to give you kind of like an update of how that whole process went. So this started in 2019. So even though the legislation just passed, we were kind of like seeing this coming and um, we were lucky enough to be part of what they call the transformation zone. <coughs> and so we partnered with SCRED and um, MDE in providing leader, all this literacy training. Um, so we're a partnership with MDE and SCRED in all that we're doing and what I'm about to present. So, what we did then in 2019 is it started, I think these click in one at a time, probably Michelle, for dramatic effect. So in 2019, <laughs> we trained seven teachers and myself in the science of reading using letters. And this is a two-year training system. Um, it is 64 hours of training for teachers outside uh, the classroom and inside the classroom. And um, those seven people were like, this is really amazing. We should probably train more people. So we just opened it up and asked more people if they wanted to. And 24 people did the training in 2020, 21. Now, if you notice, like, COVID was in there. So we did have more people originally signed up. And then when COVID hit, it, it did go down. It was going to be, like, 50-some people who were interested. Um, so that did go virtual um, in the spring of 2020. I will say that next that group in 2020-21, those 24 teachers were really the impetus of all the change we did because when we were meeting with them, and I should say slightly before that, I became a trainer in between that, so then like I can help train all those teachers, um, so I was part of all those cohorts. They were like, we aren't aligned with the science of reading. Now, and what that means basically is it's a whole bunch of research that's been done for 20 years that now has been like, put in a digestible way that we as educators understand what the brain research means. And so we we can look through brain scans and really know how do kids actually learn how to sound out letters and pair them up and how do they decode and read. And then we were looking at our curriculum and we we're like, there are things it does well and there are things that it does not do well. And so that group in 2020, 21 were like, we, we need to make change. So in the next year in 21, 22, we increased our trainings we had 52 teachers sign up, and then you can see on the right, we decided to implement a whole new master schedule in all of our elementary buildings. We used a new, uh, what's called a work recognition curriculum. That's the phonics, that's the sounding of letters and hearing sounds. In our classroom K2, we piloted a language comprehension curriculum. That is um, the knowledge building piece. So for the science of reading, you need two things. You need to be able to like sound out letters and decode words and read them. 
but then you have to have knowledge of what that word would mean. So like vocabulary and syntax and background knowledge. So it's two pieces. So we created a master schedule that uses, is built on those two pieces. We have the one new curriculum for word recognition and then we piloted a new one for language comprehension. And then we also piloted a fidelity check of just like going around and watching to see how will we know if this is working. Then the next year, and this just kept expanding, we had 26 more teachers trained. We went full implementation on both those curriculums. We added in a coach, which in that year was funded fully by MDE, because they're honestly, like we were one of the first in the entire state to do this. So they were watching everything we were doing. So we piloted the fidelity check that MDE was recommending. They paid for a coach so that they could show that an instructional coach will help teachers implement. And then we created a, a district letters team to oversee the entire implementation. And then in this year, we have an additional 28 teachers being trained, and we've expanded. It's not only just elementary K-5, it's our middle school English teachers, all of our special ed teachers that teach special ed reading, all of our intervention teachers, all of our speech language pathologists as well. So um, we, and for everybody else in the state, they just got the order like you have to train now. And like we are almost all fully trained at this point in our district. Um, it is a two year process. So when they, that's the year they started the training and then they finish it in two years. Then we thought, I just want you to see like how it blew up. But really to implement all the science of reading, these are the pieces we found that you need to have. So I'm just going to go through the arrow so you can see the continuum. So first you have to train all your teachers. And then <laughs> here's, here's the training. <laughs> so um, the next slide tells you the training. So we selected letters right away. Um, letters is put on by Lexia. It has two volumes. Um, as you can see, 32 hours of online modules and then another 32 hours in person for a total of 64 hours in volume one. Year two is 24 hours of online and then another um, in person of 32 hours. So how we do that is we do one full day in August, and then we've been using all of our staff development days for these teachers where they spend half that day doing letters training. Uh, we are fortunate that we have trainers. I think that's the next one. Um, that's everybody who we train. So all K-5, all K-12 SPED reading, all intervention teachers, speech language pathologists, <coughs> and middle school English. And then the next slide tells you where we're fortunate is we have our own trainers. So the rest of the state is kind of in a quandary, like how do we get people who can even train on this? We have, I can train it all, and then we have three people who can train volume one, and we have another two who can train volume two, and those are teachers in our staff. And so I think that's been a really key to the success is our teachers really respect each other, and so having our own knowledgeable staff standing up front doing the training has been phenomenal. And those facilitators go, they have a score, a certain, like over 95% on all tests, and then they have to um, go through a week-long training every summer to keep this up. Plus, we have to do eight hours of online training throughout the year where um, the newest research comes out as WebExes, and then we have to take those, and we have to pass quizzes on those as well. So that's who is training our staff. <coughs> then um, the next piece is master schedule. So if you're going to implement science of reading, what is that actually look in an elementary building? We decided to split reading into two blocks of time at the elementary. For those two pieces, you need to have the science of reading. So the word recognition block, it's a little bit longer in K2, so it's about 50 minutes to each block, but K2 is a little longer on word recognition because they really need to learn how to decode. And then in the upper grades, 3-5, they have a little longer in the long language comprehension block. But you can see the two different pieces of what it takes then to build reading. So in those two pieces, it's a total of about 100 minutes of a day K5. The other thing you should know for the master schedule is all students are in that language comprehension block. And what I mean by that is, like, if a kid has an intervention they need or special education IP or whatever, they do not get pulled out during language comprehension. All students stay in the classroom, so they all have access to building the knowledge and the vocabulary that they need. Then with the word recognition block, we flex it, which just basically means we sort the students based on where they are in that phonics skills. It's kind of like swimming, like you have to learn this skill and as you learn this one, you do the next. That's kind of how phonics works. Like you have to learn all your letters and all their sounds. And tapping. This is what we do when we teach phonics, is you tap sounds <laughs> and then you blend them. So um, they have to learn all those letters and all their sounds. And then once you get the basics, like just like B is book, then you can do like shh 
that's a die graph. I didn't know any of this prior to it. Like I taught high school history, so it, it's been an amazing transformation. But then it just builds those skills. So we flex kids. So some kids are maybe still struggling with learning just letters and sounds, and so they're flexed together. Some kids have that, and they might get the advanced phonics skills. Like what do you do? Like why do you spell it? Um, like a um, like the letter the sound I can be spelled with an I, but it can be spelled with an I G H. And like, how do you know the difference? That's more advanced. So we flex kids based on their phonics needs. In fourth and fifth grade, they all stay. They get advanced phonics, like like morphology. So once you know sounds and letters, then you have to like you go to parts like prefixes, like um, like if the word is presidential. The dent in the middle is a root, and so kids learn what that means, and then what would the suffix I-A-L mean? And so they are breaking apart big words and learning how to spell and decode big words. And then they get the 80 minutes of language comprehension, which is the, the knowledge building. And then we pull kids different time for additional intervention if they're still struggling to learn to read. So that's a master schedule change. All three buildings have that in elementary. Then we have to find resources to match because our curriculum didn't really match. So for the word recognition block, with that spread group, we realized there was nothing on the market that met that need. So we started writing our own. And spread was huge, a huge piece of this. I want to give them a lot of recognition for it. They helped us. Um, we had some of our own teachers help write the curriculum. It was so good that U of M has now taken it over and is selling it and, and, and selling it out to the market. Um, it is now called Functional Phonics 2.0. And it is one of only three that got, got approved by the state to be used for um, this helpful emotional skills. Um, our teachers still, two of our teachers are still writers on it, so every summer they, they get a separate contract with the, with the U of M to be hired by them to write that curriculum, and then um, they make the adjustments in the summer too. Our other block is called CKLA, Core Knowledge Language Arts, built to embed science and social studies. So they are learning that kind of content <coughs> and putting their literacy block. Um, it was a free version. It wasn't totally, I mean, it's free, but you had to, you have to print it. So it's, I don't want it to think that it was totally free. Like the copying cost was almost equivalent to buying the whole entire curriculum. But that's what we used for that one. We also found you need a whole bunch of other stuff to go with it, which is the next slide. So to teach reading, you have to have things like whiteboards, letter tiles, mirrors, so they can see the shape of their mouths and how they move. And there's things called vowel valleys and consonant charts. So we got all that and we used escrow funds for all, all of those versions. Then the next piece is fidelity checks. So this just means how do we know if it's working? Like going around and seeing how is the curriculum working and where do teachers need more support? That is the main point is how is the system, is the implementation going and how can we support you? So three times a year, uh, myself, our literacy coach, and then members from our region and SCRED, MDE, have come in to watch our classrooms. It's a 10-minute walkthrough that we do in every single elementary classroom, plus intervention and special ed room. And we have look-fors. And then from that, we're like, okay, we need, we need to work on this. We need to do this in our training, or this is what we need to do for coach. And we, our district letters team is who looks at that data. It's all anonymous. No teachers are identified by it. Um, because it's a systems check, it's not an individual evaluation at all. Um, I'll show you some, the next slide I think shows you some results. So you can see, I'll try to explain it as easy as you can, but these are the main categories of what we look for for implementation. So like, basically the very final bar, if you just want to focus on that, is your, our overall implementation. And the scores are on the next one, I think specifically, but you can see if you, yeah, you can go to that one if you want, Michelle. Mm -hmm. There are seven categories of what you're looking for in implementation, and the, the one you really want to focus on is right here this school year, 2024, our total scores of 1.65. The highest you can get is a 2.0. And once you hit 1.6, it means you have implemented with fidelity, everybody's doing what they're supposed to, it's accurate, 1.65, 1 1.6. A 1.8 is like you are. Like it is, it's called fluency. Like everybody's doing it and it's easy and it's automatic and they don't like, they don't have to rely on a script while they teach, like it's just fluid. So we're not quite at fluency, but we've only been, we've only are two years in. Um, and so this is what we as a team look at. And then we look at these scores and say like, where we want to help. The main thing, like year one was pacing, like we weren't fluid. Like teachers were like, what am I supposed to say and how am I supposed to tap? You know, it was clunky as you're learning. Now pacing's really good, that's happening. And now it's more like, how do you differentiate for all those different needs and looking at that? And how do you work? Um, and we had accuracy issues the first 
first year too. Kids like some of the teachers had never taught like this explicit of phonics. So there was some accuracy the first year we looked at. Now pacing's better, and now it's looking at how do you even differentiate further. So that's what we use as a team for how the implementation is going. Lastly, you really need coaching. This was a huge change for a lot of teachers, and they needed support. So we had that grant from MDE for a 1.0 FTE literacy coach. The grant wasn't extended to this year, so our coaches reduced to a 0.5. She works three days a week, one day in each of the elementary buildings. And um, she's amazing. Like, I came to, I, if anything, I just want to emphasize, like, we couldn't have done this without our literacy coach. She is there modeling lessons. She will take the class and show them how it should work and then answer questions for them. She'll co-plan with them. She'll co-teach with them. She, teachers can say, come and observe me. Tell me what I need to do. And some of it wasn't even literacy. It's like, how do you set up your classroom for success? Like, where do you put your materials so that you don't have to scramble to get the whiteboards and the letter tiles? And classroom behaviors are amazing because she's a management expert, too. So it's, I can't even emphasize it enough. I don't know how we would have done it without her. Um, so she mostly focused on brand new teachers who have never taught before, really getting their classroom set up and the implementation of reading. And um, the other big thing she did that we didn't plan on was helping them analyze their data. So once they're assessing kids and they see how they're doing, a lot of them are like, okay, now what do I do? Like, what do I do next? Like, she's helping them say, like, this is what you need to teach in your classroom. They don't yet have this sound. And so she helps them figure out their data, too. So then, um, almost at the end, so all this process is overseen by the district letters team. And on that team, we have one principal, one teacher per elementary building, one SPED, one reading intervention teacher, and then myself, the director of teaching and learning. And we meet monthly. Um, and then, so really, I've learned so much about implementation. To make sure that we're functioning well, we also have what's called a district capacity assessment to see if our, our team is doing everything we're supposed to do for the implementation. And you can see our growth for that as well. Um, the last bar is what we just did in January, and we're, we're at past acquisition, and we're almost at fluency as a team on how we're functioning. The next slide breaks that down by area. So, like, organizational leadership is the first category. Like, so you have to, like, do you have a team? Do you have a team that meets frequently? Do you know what you're doing? That's that first piece. Competency is talking about things like, do you have strategies for improvement? Do you have questions built into your hiring process about the science of reading? Um, do you have training? Do you have a training? And everything, like some of our points where we didn't quite make the total is we don't have everything in writing yet. You have to have a written plan for everything. A written plan for what if you have a barrier? How do you overcome a barrier? What if your group can't make a decision? What's your decision you know, making matrix and how you decide? So it is intense. Um, and then at the last two is data. Are you looking at data? And then um, what's your total score? So we as a team are analyzing this. And lastly, I just want to say where we're at. So we still need to finish training. Um, we have to get to the law to say that high school English teachers also have to be trained. Anybody in charge of implementing ELA standards. Um, so we are looking at adding that in. They're called phase two trainers or teachers. So um, the state told us to wait a little bit if we want because they might have some more guidance on what that means for the high school levels versus the elementary. Um, the other thing is, what do you do once you're trained? Like, just because you've been trained once doesn't mean you remember it all. It was a lot of information. So we're looking at how we provide PD ongoing. Um, Taylor's Falls has been piloting um, a plan with that. They've been doing um, trainings within their staff meetings to bring back things. Um, and they're, they're fortunate. They have a volume one letters facilitator trainer and a volume two in their building. And Jason's on our, uh, Reby, the principal there, is on our letters team. So they kind of took it upon themselves to create like a pilot. And so they have been trying things on the TF, and it seems like it's going well that we may replicate at the other two buildings. We also have to dig more into writing. We're going to do some summer work around that. And then um, there's a curriculum called functional morphology that goes with functional phonics, but for grades four or five, so for those advanced <coughs> decoding skills. We are doing it in fourth grade this year, and we're looking to roll that up in fifth grade next year. So that's trying to do that fast. There's a lot there, but let me know what you what questions you have around our reading changes at the elementary. I just want to, if I can, just two points of context because she doesn't do it justice, and, and I appreciate Sarah so much. When we talk about being the ahead of the game, we're leading. We're leading the pack. So to be in this position right now, and somebody that went to CBNs this fall, 
you heard the MDE folks come out and every district talk about how they're scattering in the wind right now to figure out <clears> what are we going to do to get to this point? Because there's 45 hours of training, there's all these other components, and everyone's starting from the beginning line. We're already at the end. And I really appreciate our folks, Sarah, the team, our teachers, and the work they put in. We have people coming over continuously to our district to see the work that's going on. So I just want to make sure I highlight that piece because, again, I know sometimes we don't give ourselves enough pats on the back. Sarah deserves that. Michelle deserves it. Our entire team, our trainers, they're doing really good work overall. And I think more importantly, too, I really appreciate the point that she brought up about our fidelity checks to see where we're at. For us to be two years in and be almost to a point where we are absolutely deliberate with fidelity to the highest level is phenomenal. Most change when you do things like that, especially curriculum-wise, it's usually a cycle of three years you sort of struggle through it, by year four you're getting where you need to be, and by probably seven to ten you're sort of in your DNA, it's good to go. We're seeing that piece as well. We'll work on some of these pieces because we want to start talking more about this as some of our metrics for our community too. We are moving kids in the right direction. We all know that three by third grade well is a benchmark for success. So just know that's coming down the road the next few months, probably in the newsletter, probably some other things as well. We want people to know that we're we're doing a great job with it here. And we have a lot to be proud of. But thank you for your work for all that too. I this is over dramatic, but I was telling my sister the other day, like if I were to die, I feel like this is our legacy. <laughs> like, <laughs> wow, wow. 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 is amazing. It's the thing I'm like the most proud of. Like honestly, like it's not for 15 years, but this, like this is going to impact all of our kids. For uh, I'm so proud of the work our teachers are doing. It's amazing. So Sarah, we need you to stick around um, because, and I want to just echo what Brian just said. I mean, you had the foresight early on to say. This is amazing. This could be transformational. We're moving on this, even if before we were told we needed to. Mm -hmm. You identified it and you got us going. And this has been a big change for our staff, right? Like I went through the training too. Mm -hmm. It's 64 hours. You're already working. You're already, you know, and um, it's intense. You learn a lot. It makes you feel like, oh, what have I taught in the past without knowing all this? So, but it's amazing. The impact, watching what's happening. I've subbed a couple of times in the reading department at the primary school and it really is amazing. And so thank you, thank you. Yeah, I feel fortunate that when we, like I get to see every teacher at least three times a year, teach throughout the year, every, and it, it is amazing. It's the most fun getting to see how the reading program is going and watching our teachers. It, it's it's like, magic. Pop in if you can. It's <clears throat> and then I know at the M MDE level, they've talked to us at leadership things and said their next phase now is going to the colleges and saying, instead of us having to take on all this training, it would be great if people would be coming out of college prepared and with these skills so that it doesn't fall on the individual district. And so. it should. I'm glad you mentioned. So I got really obsessed over reading when all this happened. So I'm now on the Minnesota Reading League board. And um, there's a lady there named Abby Payer on it. She's at Bethel College. And so she's leading a cohort of colleges on it. And she mentioned that um, the universities now have to submit all of their programming to Pelsby to make sure that they can prove our teachers are ready to teach the science of reading as they leave college. So hopefully by 25, it says any new graduates will be trained. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. In 25, it will start being in the program. So if it takes four years for them to graduate, it should eventually come to us because kids who are ready for it, if they go to a Minnesota college. Yeah, that's great to hear. That's yes. Great. Yeah. Sarah, would this be a measure of success? Like another way that we measure success besides oh, sure. MCAs? And I, you know, not everybody can see this. And we've had a lot of discussion about, you know, measures of success, MCA tests, ACT scores, and things like that. And if you look at the data, it's pretty remarkable. And I didn't put our reading scores in, but we have some, like our early indicators of our reading scores are it's so nuanced, I felt like I'd have to explain what all the subtests mean, but like our scores are moving in the right directions too, that we're seeing from implementation. And like you mentioned, um, we have had four site visits, I think, of other schools across the state coming to watch what we're doing. And one of them had, it was a collaborative, so there were 11 people here, all from different districts, all in one site visit. Um, your sister. Like they're coming and they're watching and learning from us what we're doing. So that's been really, like, really a proud moment too. And from the beginning, the 64 hours, I mean, our teachers were compensated for it. It was a lot of extra time. A lot of work came out of staff development. And, you know, there's a, quite a commitment. During that time, we have new teachers that will be coming in as we, you know, have attrition and people leave and new people come in as well. So it's good to see. You know, there's so much to unravel when you see a program like this. 
And when we were at sea, the schools that are there, they're they're not happy because this is a lot of money to train. Think about schools that might have three, four, five, six hundred elementary teachers. And so we to be ahead of the game is saving us a lot of money as well. So it's <laughs> You know, to preflect what we needed to do, I you know commend you on those and everybody else. And it, it's not very easy to train, uh, change teachers' ideas about you know a big change in a lot of training. So it was, uh, I think, uh, commending you and our district and saving us a pile of money that we don't now have to go spend a lot of money to train, even though there's some money for it, uh, and a whole bunch of other things. I've taught first, second, and third grade with this. Did you try? I have done all of those things, but it's tough when you come in as a sub. Uh -huh. So I'm thinking I better get the training too or something like that. But what's remarkable to me is the first and second and third graders, when you got six, seven year olds telling you how it goes, because you rely as a sub, you rely heavily on the students that are in the classroom. And they're telling you how to do the different things. I mean, it's a lot, right? I come in, I'm teaching first, second, and third grade, and First of all, it's a challenging thing to teach kids that age, but then to teach a curriculum that is kind of remarkable. I mean, it is uh, a tech, it's technical reading, it's technical, it's a different language, and all those things that we do. So I just am really impressed, but it's tough when you're a sub coming in and doing it. And I would just ask, you know, say, board members, if you haven't seen it done, go watch it. Cause you got the first graders going from class to class to class to class as they're rotating through, and I got like six pages of notes to how I'm supposed to do this. It's it's really something that you got to kind of have in there and a lot of practice in order to become second hand to you. So it's just really cool to see this and all the positive things again that are a benefit to our district. I think like I don't want people to leave too thinking it's just phonics. That language comprehension piece and knowledge building is amazing too. Like the science and social studies knowledge our elementary kids have now. And I think that's the biggest thing we've been hearing from parents from parent teacher conferences is they're sitting home and talking about Roman, the Roman Empire in third grade. You know, it's like that's and as a history teacher, I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that is so fun. Tell us a little bit about how you onboard new teachers that yeah. don't have this training yet. Like, what does that look like for the team and for that system? So, any if we hire and then we have you, you're going into the training. Yeah. Um, but honestly, the literacy coach, so Michelle, meets with all the new teachers. Um, she'll meet with them in August. She will set their room up, like help them actually lay out the room of where to put materials, and then she um, she will actually go in and teach the first few left like like teach for them um, right away in the first week she tries to teach for all the new teachers so that they can see what it could look and like what it look like and should look like for the functional phonics piece. Yeah. CKLA is not as hard to be at. Like CKLA is a read aloud for kids on content in grades K through three. Four or five kids are reading it, but it's the functional phonics that is harder to implement. I mean you have to know like why is it voiced or unvoiced and does your you know can you feel the air and it's so nuanced in the tapping and blending and there's rules like you should tap left or right from the kids view and so she she works with all the new teachers um and every single week like the first few weeks she meets with them if not daily at least weekly to get them on board and then they're in the training which i will say we debated like should you throw them in training when they're brand new um but for the most part even though they say it's overwhelming it makes they kind of understand the curriculum. The, they're like, oh, now I know why it's built the way it is because it aligns with what we're learning in training. <clears throat> so yeah. if we didn't have Michelle, I don't know how we would do it. I'd have to figure that out. But she takes all that around, but that's really cool. And I really appreciate the way you told the story, that idea of the 24 teachers taking this training and then seeing the gaps in what we've been teaching. like. And then just transformative action across. The That's how I felt like, like when just like foresight. It was real, those twenty four were like, we can't keep doing this. It's not right. And then I think because we're in COVID, we're like, we can't wait. Yeah. Like there was that sense of urgency. It was like we know we just had COVID and we have kids who are going to be struggling, and what we're doing doesn't align with what we know of brain research. Like we have to change. Yep. When you know better, do better. I yes. guess it's very yes. exciting to girls. So uh, I got a two-part question. I'm not as familiar with this as I think a lot of the other people are here. Can you just kind of briefly just tell me the difference? Like, what were we doing before? Mm -hmm. And then what's happening with the science of reading that's like makes it so awesome? Right. And then the second part of that question is you talked a little bit about it, but student outcomes. How do you measure the success that you've been seeing? So two really good questions. So first question, what we used to do is like we did some phonics. 
but I would say it wasn't explicit like that, like feel in your voice the difference between like, like the is the letter P, you can feel the air, and then go ba. It's the same mouth movement, but the ba you can feel in your throat. So we teach kids like voiced versus unvoiced. So it's like right in that moment, like we never taught it like feel it in your throat. We were just like, P, hear me, repeat after me. Like now it's like you can feel it, you can see it. And so it's much more explicit. The other thing is a lot of curriculums used to do, um, if you don't know the word, look at the picture and make your best guess. Like that is not good. Like don't do that. <coughs> Instead, you want to you want to sound out as much of it as you can. And even words like, um, I'm trying to think, like said, said as A-I-D. You know, we used to do like just memorize it. Doesn't make sense. It's a goofy word. Just memorize it, and kids would have flashcards and just like do that. But most of said can be sounded out. So you sound out this, and you sound out the th at the end. It's the AI that you need to learn, and we call those hard parts of a word. And then, and actually, if you can teach morphology with it, you can say, well, the word was say, and then we added past tense, and you can explain the history of the word so that then it makes sense to them. So instead of learning that our English language is hard and it doesn't make sense, you actually teach them that it's actually, if you get down to it, it's over 90% of our words do make sense if you know the rules. So it's much more explicit. I also think that knowledge building piece was huge. We weren't doing that. So what we know is even, so there's this thing, I, oh, I get nerded out, you guys, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> there's a thing I say in all studies. It's, um, it was done by the University of Minnesota, and it's the Rex study in Leslie, and they taught kids, they were talking to people about, like, what do you think makes the most, um, why can kids read? Is, so they did this study and they divided kids up by like reading scores and knowledge of baseball. And then they gave them a passage about baseball. And their prediction was kids who read the best will do the best on this test. And what they found is it wasn't the best readers that did the best. It was kids who had knowledge on baseball. And so what they found, well, kids who could read and do baseball outperformed everybody. But then the next one was just kids who knew baseball. And they replicated this study over and over and over on different topics, and they found that knowledge is actually a really big component to how well kids can read. Because even if you can decode, if you don't know what the words mean, you can't make sense of what you're reading. So you have to have a knowledge-based curriculum as well. So we, our old curriculum wasn't really knowledge-based. You would read a story today, tomorrow's a different story, and the next story. They didn't tie in, and they didn't teach kids any like big concepts. So now we spend like three weeks on the Roman civilization and everything we read is about that. So they're building that information up. And what's nice is it, it built. So like what they do in kindergarten, or even we have it in early childhood as well, is building into kindergarten, into first, into second, into third. So everything's building. So they'll get like the American Revolution about three times before they leave elementary and each layer is just building upon each other. So you need the knowledge and then you need that explicit on it. Then how do we measure success? So you have to two different ones. So on the phonics piece, we break it right down to like, do they know letters, names? Do they know letter sounds? Can they blend the sounds? Can they break them apart? And then can they do an ORF, which is an oral reading fluency? So then once they are reading, are they able to read at a fairly decent rhythm, not too fast, but not too slow? And then once they read, can they comprehend what they read? So it's a whole bunch of different metrics that we're using. I think it's the nuanced ones. I always say like segmenting breaking about sounds, that's the one we're finding most beneficial right now to figure out where we need to instruct. Yeah. So Josh and as a part of that too, so three times a year, we test every single kid. Can they blend? Can they segment? Do they know their sounds? Do they, how many heart words do they know? So that we know, okay, this kid doesn't have this part. We need a little intervention for a while to get them where they need to be. So we're constantly checking kids and getting them the help they need to get <coughs> what they need. So that assessment, it's informative to teaching. It's not just, here's your number at the end of 12th grade. This is who you are. Nope. Have you needed help along the way? We're going to get it for you. We're going to help you with the skills you don't have. And I think that's a huge part of it, too. Thank you for letting me take so much time. Oh, Obviously, my gosh. It's so, so exciting. exciting. <laughs> Anytime you want to come by. <laughs> it's exciting. It's super fun. And Sarah, we're going to keep up, keep you up there because know, we're so going to move on to the American Indian. Super easy. I just be, um, this is required by law that we have an American Indian Parent Advisory Committee. They meet um, almost monthly on Thursdays, and so they have a resolution that they are in concurrence with what we're, they have to say whether they concur with how we're teaching Native American students in our district, and they do. And so we just need to expect, uh, accept that resolution. And it looks like it's a resolution. Yes. Okay. Are there any questions about this piece of for the rest of the school board. Okay, if not, we'll have a roll call vote. Sarah, we'll start with you. 
Agenda. This includes our claims and accounts, our personnel items, so please get a chance to look at them, and our January minutes. So we'll need a motion, and then if there's any questions to entertain about the consent agenda. I do have a question. Okay. When we, after I got done looking through, I think it was eight or nine pages this time, <laughs> claims accounts. I did have a, a, something that came to mind. And we are like looking to seek support from businesses and stuff. So I'm wondering, do we make it, do we encourage the teams or the, the organizations to use our local businesses when they have things going on? Because I just think it would be good for us to be thoughtful, you know, in our, we want help from them, we should also help them. So. I will tell you that as part of some of the work we do with the newsletters, there's going to be an opportunity for us to carve out space and time to support our businesses that are supporting us to get them recognition. We also have something that we're working on this summer to sort of get our brand out in our business fronts as well and talk <coughs> more specifically with them. So give us a couple of months, I'll come back with something. But we, we have plans already in place to do some of that starting this summer. Yep. Question. We still need a motion, and then we can entertain more questions if there are any. I'll make a motion. We have a motion. Any other questions? I'll second it. Okay, do we have a second? Andrea? All in favor say aye. 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 Against. Stay. You're abstaining? I'm okay. Um, I'll ask again. All in favor say aye. 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 With one abstain. <laughs> okay. Wasn't sure the order. Okay, that's okay. <laughs> Okay, um, so that motion passes. We have no old business, so we will move on to new business. And it looks like the first point is our donations. We had our Wildcat bed making project, and this looks like it's a wrap up. Is there someone going to speak to this? Or is it just for our information? They just sent over the last spreadsheet. So just as a reminder, our class at the high school had the idea to build beds <coughs> for kids in our community who needed beds. And this project took off. And then the community got a hold of it and we started getting donations so before long we weren't only making beds for kids Correct. we had mattress pads and we had pillows and we had sheets and we had comforters and we had donations for next year's beds that we're going to make and turned into this lovely project where kids got beds and our kids made them so i love the whole thing but this just looks like it's an accounting of all the different donations and as i was looking at this it was everything from our businesses to just random teachers <coughs> and community members saying, I'll give this much money for this, and I believe in this, and so it's just fun to look at all the donations that came in. It was Scott Leffler's kind of brainchild, but it was Mike Sandell's class that did it. So, right. And it was on TV, if you happen to catch a clip of it, and the kids were excited about it. You walk, you can go through the high school and poke your head in the woodshop, say hi to Scott. And Mike was a shop teacher that came back after being retired three years to fill in there. So it was kind of a cool project for years. And our kids, obviously. Yeah, so. And more <coughs> kids in Chisago County are sleeping on beds. So a great project. So we will, um, we need a motion a second to accept the final donations for that bed project. We have, we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Again, same sign. That motion passes. Okay, we're on to the Chisago Lake Fan and Choir trip. Um, you can come up with Gabe if you want, or wherever you guys want to be. You can be at the table, you can be at the stand, it's up to you. <laughs> well, hello. Hello. All right. Uh, I'm sure you all know me, I'm Gabe Romeo. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Chisago Lake's Choir. And I'm Laura Carlson, and I'm here with the band. Uh, so every other year, we the band and choir tries to have a um, 
some sort of school trip on over spring break. Um, there was a pause during COVID, but our first trip back was last year, and that was to Orlando. Um, it was a great success. Kids enjoyed it, and there was a lot of music experience while we were there too. So it wasn't. It was, uh, you know, a little bit of working with workshops of people at Disney, and then you know you get to have fun too because it is spring break. But um, so the band and choir um, trips are open to students who are in ninth through twelfth grade. Um, so next year it'll be uh, classes of 2025 through 28. Um, but not all students get to go. They must be um, in good standing academically and behaviorally as well. Um, this next upcoming year, we are uh, anticipating 100 students to attend. Um, last year, 92 students attended the Orlando trip. Um, and there is predicted to be more students attending to Greece this upcoming year as well. Um, there is an eight to one student to chaperone ratio, um, approximately 12 chaperones plus the two directors and their spouses totaling 16 belts. All right, and I'll read a little bit about Greece and what we'll be doing there from the itinerary, which is also linked in the slide, I believe. Um, but travel with the Chicago Lakes High School Band and Choir on exciting cultural and music <coughs> enrichment to Greece over spring break 2025. Fly over the Twin Cities to Athens, Greece. Travel to the Peloponnese, where you explore Napulo, ancient Mycenae, Epidurus, and Corinth. Cross the spectacular Ryan and Trum Bridge over the Gulf of Corinth and the mainland to the mainland. Visit Delphi, once home to the mysterious oracle of Delphi, and considered by the ancient Greeks to be the center of the world. Conclude the tour in Athens with visits to the Acropolis Parthenon and ancient Plaka. Enjoy a cruise to the beautiful Saronic Islands. Attend performance, performances of Greek music and dance while enjoying all Greece has to offer in this once in a lifetime international journey. Right. So we're just really excited to go on this and several days students and everyone has have the chance to participate in dance lessons and just like just be surrounded by Greek culture and listen to some fun music that we aren't used to hearing. Uh, this next slide kind of just shows our routes planned. So all of these places that Laura listed, uh, in case you didn't know where they were because I don't either. There is a <laughs> diagram, it's just like a big circle around the Greece area, um, getting to know the different cultures of music and you know like what kind of instruments they play there or what kind of style of music they have and it's more um very traditional so we kind of get like an in like an insider scoop on the music styles that are there um again the trip is going to be over spring break of 2025 and it's going to last about nine days likely from friday march 7th through saturday march 15th um and our Airlines that we would use would be either Delta Airline or Lufthansa Airline. And how much? Um, we will be there for nine days, likely Friday, March 7th through Saturday, March 15th. And again, we'll use those airlines. Um, we'll do double um, occupancy hotels and one, in one body in a bed. And all but three meals will be included for a total of $3,500. Um, the numbers last year, um, so we did some fundraising and there was about $30,100 roughly raised, um, getting the total bill to $211,434.67. Um, 85 out of the 92 students that participated um, in the trip as a whole participated in fundraising as well. Um, and it averaged to about $353.90 worth of fundraising per student. Um, and then there was a high of $1,285.82. And then um, for fundraising this upcoming year, we do have um, uh, World's Finest Chocolates which are the dollar chocolate bars. Those are a big hit within a lot of our schools. I know they do it for Wolf Ridge, and I believe it's always been a giant success, and they, they do love working with us. Um, and then we do do our cup food bagging, which is, brings in a lot of 
fundraising money as well. And it also gets you um, some experience with actual people and you get to spread the word about your choir and band too as well. Um, the Delisi family also has a, a line of Italian food. So um, they last year hosted a pasta dinner. Uh, people pay to have a dinner and I believe it was, uh, I believe it was like all you can eat style, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, and then students participate by um, clearing the tables, asking if anybody needs anything, and then just kind of serving as servers as well. And then Band Boosters, um, they hosted a garage sale last year. So they got a bunch of items together and then they sold them for fundraising money as well. Mm -hmm. And then we have these band inquired decals, which are just like little stickers. There's small ones and then there's big more, bigger ones that you can put on your truck or car or anywhere on a water bottle, computer. And a lot of people like them, a lot of teachers buy them because you know they want to support our band inquired. Um, and then we also do coffee, pampered chef, and personalized water bottles, tumblers, and then one mom in band, I believe she makes these really cute little soaps that have like music notes on them. And they're just really, really cute. And so we sell, we have a fundraiser for those, and then we get some sponsorships. And then along with the soaps, we also, on the choir end, I believe Mrs. Undum had a some sort of source called Everyday Suds in the cities that offered, um, at least for one of our fundraising things that we did this year for um, new stage choir outfits and uh, <clears throat> just an overall fund. They, I believe they uh, said that every soap that or product they sold, they would donate all of their uh, revenue from that for a certain period of time while we were fundraising. Um, so we did bring, um, like a sheet for people to um, sell locally. Um, and then she she said that all sales from that go to us. And then she's, I believe she said it was 50% revenue of uh, product that she sold in her actual store also went towards us. So we do have some companies locally and within the cities that are more than, more than willing to work with us for these numbers. Do you have any questions? We can try to help. Very so well done. Th done. Thank you for the details. I don't really see the invitation for board members to go to grocery stores, though. I'm sure it's in here somewhere. <laughs> so after all the fundraising and everything, I know last year went to Orlando. I saw your video. You made it Disney and everything. What's it typically cost a kid who wants to go? Like, do you know? Like, so just depends on how the fundraising goes, but. The initial costs, and then just so the initial cost is this three thousand amount, and then just minus anything you happen to fund. Yeah. So okay. um, last year uh, we did, depending on which fundraiser it was. So for the chocolate bars, um, whatever you made from those chocolate bars okay. went into like so it went into an overall like fund, but you had your own like little um, envelope, and like they kept track per student, okay. um, and then. Um, like there's some like the cup food bagging, uh, they would just kind of split that up. Sure. Yeah, who's working? Sure. Um, and so then that would just get taken off the total amount that you had for your total. And then they do do monthly payments or like like every few months they would do like a and you know, well, yeah. So you don't have to pay all it full. And so then by the end, whatever fundraising money you made from the last time you paid would just get taken off that final amount. And if you made more than you spent total, like if you paid an amount and you made more than you paid, they do get the money back. Perfect. And I believe right, there's a parent group meeting next Wednesday. Yes, next Wednesday, the 21st um, at 7 o'clock, I believe, is the, um, the meeting for parents and anybody interested to get Yes. I believe they'll probably go through the slideshow. Yeah, and it's just informing information. No money is due. What yes. after that when you sign up, every the, you pay in installments. So it doesn't come out once. Yeah. And is that thirty five hundred? Just like what they're estimating. Yes. Yes. Sounds great. Sounds like a great trip, you guys. Yeah. Any other questions for them? I know when I first heard about it because I did attend the Orlando trip last year. Um, and you guys had 
free reign at Disney, right? Yes. So my first thought as a parent was, how do we keep that many kids safe in the um, And the answer is, this tour group that they're working with, is it's, a, it's kind of a smaller group. They don't work with a lot of bands and choirs, and they almost interview us as well. Um, and they just run a really tight ship. So instead of where you were, when you were in Orlando and you know, lunch was kind of free reign wherever you were in the, in the park, um, the meals are all, everything's all together. Everyone's, everyone's learning all together. It's, it's more of a learning experience than maybe Disney was. Sounds wonderful. So if there's no further questions, we'll need a motion and second to okay this trip to Greece for our band and choir. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Against, same sign. Thanks very much. You guys yes. did a great job. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so we need to move on to some calendar revisions for the 2024-2025. I'll speak on behalf of our three elementary principals who are bringing this to you guys. Okay. Every now and then, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Day falls on our same day as our staff development day. So they've asked us to move what we traditionally have as elementary conferences that first week in February backwards to the last week in January. So staff will have the staff development day and then the following week we'd have two sets of conferences and then that Friday off for elementary only. So it's the same thing for 24, 25 and 25, 26 MLK Day lands on our staff development day. So they're just requesting that we move it up by one week. Is that the only change? Yeah, that's the only change. Any other questions about the calendar changes? Thanks, Michelle. If there's no other questions, we'll take a motion and a second to accept the calendar revisions. I'll make a motion. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Against, same sign. The calendar revisions pass. Okay, we're moving on to preschool and kids club fee increases. Um, Dan is remote. Oh, Dan is remote. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, my apologies. I am at a conference in St. Cloud, so I appreciate you allowing me to jump in remotely, Madam Chair and members of the board. Um, just want to uh, kind of come before you guys to uh, look at and consider rate increases for our 2024 preschool and preschool age kids club only. So this will not impact um, anybody within Kids Club who is uh, not of that preschool uh, age demographic. So, um, and within this, we are currently working towards providing an all day, every day uh, component to our preschool offerings as well. Um, for those of you who were on the board last year, you remember, I really pushed hard for us not to have uh, the wait list that was currently the model prior. Um, and this is in response to our families, in response to the marketplace, um, their, their desire, kind of where they want to go, um, where they'd like to see us, you know, the service they'd like to see us provide. So um, this would be offered on both sides of the district at Primary and Taylor's Falls. But the numbers will dictate and tell us what uh, the market uh, um, wants to respond to, right? So we don't know for sure whether we're going to have two sections at Primary, one at Taylor's Falls. Uh, the goal would be to offer at both and some survey data that we got um, from current 304 age families and some other survey items that we've done. Um, we kind of have a pretty good sense that uh, this is going to be the direction that we will probably take, but we want to engage all of our stakeholders. We want to make sure that our teaching staff has the opportunity to weigh in, make sure that they're uh, the the factors that we might not be considering are, are taken in as well. So um, that rate is in here and included, but it's not 100% that by next year, all of these ducks are gonna line up in a row, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So um, again, same thing as you guys saw last February, um, we're still more affordable uh, for families than our neighboring districts, Forest Lake, Stillwater, North Branch, and so on. Um, I broke down the rates on slide four um, and, and, you know, all of our, we're not necessarily always comparing an apple to an apple because in Forest Lake, um, it's site specific things like that. But, um, you know, we have, we have the option and these options will remain even with the all day, every day choice, by the way, um, we want to be as 
inclusive as we can for families. Inventory doesn't change because currently we have a preschool classroom that sit in days, um, a number of days of, of the week. So, um, you know, the need for additional classroom space or anything like that is not on the table either. Um, but the, the half day comparison, so comparing, we're going up about uh, $15 on the low end um, proposed uh, to go up and then $10 um, and $14, depending on which um, rate uh, or which which of those half days or all days or three days a week or, or two days a week that families choose. And again, we're still uh, comparable and lower than um, area school districts who also offer this service, as well as this slide six that we are on right now. Um, I kind of broke it down and I broke down all day every day uh, against Wild Rooted there. They offer $25 a day for two hours, which we don't really have a two hour a day service. So kind of breaking it down and said 12.50 an hour, our hourly breakdown is 6.40 per hour at the full day, 5.78 per hour for Monday through Friday, a.m. or p.m. Uh, two and a half hour days would be 5.80 per hour for the Monday, Wednesday, Friday, a.m. and p.m. And two and a half hours uh, is 6.20 uh, for the Tuesday, Thursday. And of course, you know, th that sort of that lower, you know, why you might ask, well, why is the lowest option uh, that expensive for families? And part of that is relative to the cost, right? And and this year, by getting rid of the wait list, we had classrooms that only had 10 kids in it, but I was okay with that. I mean, I, I feel like the, the past model wasn't beneficial to our program and it wasn't beneficial to our families or our kids to say, okay, we have, you know, 10 kids that want to be on this, but we're not going to offer programming because we're going to put you on a wait list. And then we might open up a spot in December and those families obviously have found other child care and options and preschool options. So, um, and then comparing to room for growing, which sort of the all day, everyday model, and there would be a rest time during all day, every day, which would then provide our teachers prep time and things like that. Um, similar model, I'm, I'm at a community education conference and I've had quite a few extensive conversations about this with my colleagues and, and it's a similar model to what we had in Detroit Lakes and, and, and uh, uh, but the room for growing comparison uh, is $1,300 a month, and we'd be at $800 a month if the rates uh, that I proposed for you guys are approved. Um, brief details for this. Uh, registration opens March 11th. We've had several conversations with Jason and Amy, principals at Primary and Taylor's Falls. Still some conversations that need to happen a little bit with our teaching staff and uh, conversations that need to happen with some scred, um, some scred things as well. Um, but we're going to, we would plan on opening registration with multiple choices for the family. It's just like we always do with this as one of the options, should it be approved? Um, and then kids club, we're just proposing to go up by $1, uh, for the preschool age wraparound care, which we would also continue to offer. So currently many especially you know the, the while well, the numbers i'll give you from taylor's falls 18 of our 19 students that are in a half day preschool are also in our kids club so you know the some of the things like learning loss and some of those kind of pieces uh preparation for kindergarten we just really feel like it's time to move our district towards this as an option so that's all i have similar similar increase to what we kind of had to come before you for last year same kind of pressures, um, same kind of business model, same, same kind of those kind of pieces. So I will open up the floor for questions. Have you had any pushback on the fee increase from anybody? Um, there was, I think there was some confusion relative to some teaching staff initially. And um, part of that was more timing. Um, we certainly never intend to leave them out of the discussion or out of the equation. Um, but as I interpreted it, this was for the first step that we needed to take prior to, you know, we don't, we weren't, we're not going to know numbers or any of those kind of things. We can do a survey, but until people actually sign up on March 11th, this is, this is the same process that we've done as far as I know for many years in the district. So. 
Dan, this is Lori. Can you remind me again, is there a sliding scale based on need for preschool? Um, or, I'm sorry. Well, I'm, I'm looking at Carmen and Ian. They're giving me the big no. So I was just curious about uh, yeah. if, if there was a sliding scale based on need for preschool at all. No, we, we do not have that in place, okay. no. Okay. And then I think I would just like to say, just as a reading teacher and talking to other reading teachers, I mean, this is something that they came to me about and said, if we could just have some kids come more prepared to learn, it would be play a huge role in the amount of interventions and reading teachers we need at the primary school because there's just some kids that don't have the same exposures. So I really love the idea of having a school-sponsored and structured preschool program that's available to families that need full day options. We've all read the research. There are no daycare options. I mean, not no. There's very few daycare options for families. And if we can structure it um, and we can get those kids in our system early and keep them there, as Brian talked about you know, earlier, I just think it's a wonderful idea. I know there'll be some growing pains, but any change brings growing pains. But I love the concept of it, and I love the concept of getting kids some early learning. So, yeah, and I, I think it was a really well done. It just shows the value of what a great need we've been talking about for a couple of years that we have this need out there you know, of a number of students that are on waiting lists and people that want to get in and the needs of uh, full time and all day. Uh, but I do want to just uh, make a clarification the insensitivity and respect to wild rooted. It is a completely different program, and I know there's a slide in here, and those people are people that really support our schools. And I just want to say it is a hands-on enrichment, experiential learning in outdoor education. It's a little bit different, different kind of program, and yet we have a slide in there. And so just out of sensitivity mm -hmm. for what Wild Rooted does for our children. It's just it's a day camp, and it's kind of an hourly camp, and it is just a little bit different. But I just think your information just shows the value in comparison to other schools and in value in comparison to other programs that are like the one that we are presenting. And yeah, I and I appreciate those comments, Jeff. I mean, certainly <laughs> certainly never meant to intend or to suggest that, um, you know, people have to charge what they deem that their market will bear out for their own individual businesses. And yeah, I mean, I, you're right. I mean, we're, we are a little bit of a different animal. I just, to your point, there's not a ton of us in the space in, in within the county. There are more coming. Um, I do know that I'm on some county collaboratives that uh, there are more and more centers that are moving up from the north, uh, from the metro, uh, moving up into our um, into our county. Uh, so it, it was really more kind of to try to compare a little bit. But I agree, Jeff. I, it, it's not an apple to an apple. I agree, and I appreciate you uh correcting me within that realm just to to, to make sure because i certainly don't want to suggest uh anything but them as a good partner and a willing partner and 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 great opportunity for our families as well anyone else have questions about this i get to walk around primary with amy today because <laughs> i haven't really been in that building before and we had a really great conversation about the potential for all day every day preschool and just what that gives our community, um, both preparing those kids to be ready to learn and, uh, and supporting families. So uh, we're just growing rates today, but it's exciting to have that as something we're seeing at that point. Well, and at, as a parent who did have three kids in a daycare at a time commuting to the cities every day, this was an awesome opportunity for those, those parents. Okay, if there's no other questions, uh, we'll entertain a motion to accept the rate increases as well as the addition of all day everyday preschool. I'll make a motion. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Sorry, sorry, did you have another question? Oh, okay. Um, again, same sign. That motion passes. Thanks, Dan. Have a good conference. Thank you, guys. Appreciate your time. All right, so we are moving on to Nexus Solutions Agreement, and I know we have the folks from Nexus here today. So I, yeah, I asked them to come today just in case there's any questions, but just to give you a quick, quick recap of what we did, um, we had an opportunity to bring some vendors in to talk about sort of next steps for us, and one big aspect of that was to have a deep dive into our facilities and do a comprehensive study. 
So they were one of the teams we brought in to interview. Uh, Josh Moore was able to sit on that process as well, and at the end made a recommendation to move forward with them. So they're here tonight for us to just basically execute that agreement and start that journey together where over the next four months, and our kickoff will be next week on Thursday the 22nd, um, we'll start going ahead and going through all of our facilities to take a deep dive into what's going on, bring experts in to really look at what our story is, what we have to really address in the future. And then the nice part is the final product will be them coming back in June with a comprehensive study uh, that will be presented to the board to really sort of outline where our needs are and priorities. Uh, and give us some opportunities as well to learn how we can basically look at funding this, what's the best ways to sort of do things overall moving forward, and put together our plan for the future as well. And it leads up really well to our community advisor group we're doing this summer and also strategic plan as well. So I'll defer if I missed anything in that sort of uh, dialogue as well. But I mean, if you want to just add anything else, I'll end uh, uh, I think you have a spot on the right. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, again, we will uh, uh, we really take kind of a, a, a three phase approach. The first is the facility assessment, uh, which addresses both facility condition as well as a concept known as educational adequacy, which is how well do our, our facilities support the way teaching and learning is, is done today. Uh, second component is uh, the financial solution. So how do we pay for it? What, what's the most efficient way to pay for it so it has the, the, list, the least impact on the local community? And then the third, or the third component is the communication solution of how do we uh, make sure that we're bringing the community along so that we're building consensus at the staff, administrative board, and ultimately the community level. And uh, we help guide you through all, uh, all three of those things. So board members, we have the contract before us and either having looked at that or if you've come up with other questions in the meantime, do, does anyone have any questions beyond what you have in front of you? I think we're all excited about a systematic approach to needs of the district. We have a big district that expands all the way from over to Forest Lake and the Taylor's Falls at the border of the river and several buildings. And Kind of been hit and miss probably and it's good to have an intentional mm -hmm. systematic evaluation of our buildings and, and then talking to the people that work in those each individual areas who know best about what's going on and i just think that also is really critical to get uh buy-in from those that are working in those spaces so thank you very much you really won the opportunity to be here and and we thank you for your presentation and the quality in which you presented those things. And we're looking for some great outcomes. <clears throat> Any additional questions? Okay, if not, we'll need a motion and a second to approve the comprehensive plan that's presented before us. Madam Chair, I so move. We have a motion. Do we have a second? I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Again, the same sign. Motion passes. Thanks for sitting through our entire board meeting. <laughs> it was kind of exciting to get to this point, though, wasn't it? Yeah. We're excited to get going. Well, I have to tell you, we've been doing this for a long, long time. I've had hundreds of, of, of board meetings. Um, the curriculum piece on the reading was uh, uh, awesome. Thank oh, yeah, you. Absolutely. It really awesome. was. We it's feel pretty very, good about it, but it's nice yeah. to hear it from an outsider. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, no, that, that was very exciting. Quite frankly, that motivates us because we're like, now let's give them the facilities to support that. They're that excited to be teaching and learning. Let's have great facilities to do it. So, no, it's motivating for us. And um, I will right. say it's, it's anecdotal. Again, we work in tons of districts. I don't see that in every district. You guys are definitely having a very Thank simple. you so much. I appreciate it. We appreciate you being here. So if you feel like you need to leave, unless you're riveted and you want to stay, <laughs> you decide what you need to do. Thanks. Yes. Thank, Thank you so Thank much. You. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay. So we'll move on to the half-year lane changes. This is something we do every year for those folks that have earned enough credits to make some lane changes midway through the year. So they have. we have them on board book. Are there any questions about those? I make a motion to accept the Clem half-year lane change. We have a motion. I'll second it. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Again, same sign. The lane changes pass. And we have a seniority list. 
that um, we look at every year to make sure it's all accurate. And again, it's attached. Were there any questions about the seniority list? No, but I want to do say it's really important. It kind of goes out as an automatic thing every year. And I myself looked at this one time a number of years ago and saw that my hire date was wrong. And that's really kind of important to have your hire date right. And so we went back and documented it. And I didn't get a change. Now, were there any changes? Was there anybody that came up with any idea? Any thoughts as they looked at this? Well, it was well, actually my first year doing it, and I had no idea what it was. <laughs> but um, there, there wasn't a lot of changes to it. Um, I think a lot of it that we had to work through was with um, and Minnesota and the union. Just really talking about who belongs on there and who doesn't. <clears throat> Specifically with all the licensing that's out there now, with tier ones, tier twos, if they have an OFP, you know, that type of stuff. So really working closely with them. Um, and actually, one of our administrators found someone who got missed in the transition of previous HR to me being in HR. So when it was brought to our attention um, by an administrator with principals in one of our buildings, um, we immediately removed it and added it to the right spot. And so, people who so tier one teachers are really on the bottom of the list of, and because they're not renewed each year as we do that. Is that how that works? Is there a number assigned? I didn't even look at So that. actually, all tier one and tier teachers are not on this. They're not even on the rest. Okay. Right. And in previous years, tier two was on there, um, but I just don't think the question was asked. So when tier one could start being part of the bargaining group with legislative changes, I had reached out to them and Minnesota came back saying they would not be on the seniority list. So I removed them. So no changes. Nobody had a question. No, just the misspelling of the name. <laughs> People want their names to know. Any other questions about the seniority list? If not, we'll take a motion to accept the seniority list. I make a motion to accept the club seniority list. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Again, same sign. <clears throat> motion passes. Thanks for the explanation, Corey. All right. Um, we're moving on to the uh, local 284 MOU regarding the pair of work that Corey has done. I mean, we talked about this in December. This is just the official language that we have. <clears throat> that there's a lot that went into it legally um, to make sure that we had everything, what I would say, kind of buttoned up to make sure that um, no matter what took place, what our intentions were to work on paper. So uh, we finally just got to the point where both sides were good with the language. So now it's just the official MOU to have it in place. Um, but we did vote to make this change back in December. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you're you're looking for a final vote again now that it's in its final form and the MOU is before us, it sounds like. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we need a motion regarding this MOU. Okay. I'll make a motion to approve the local 284 MOU. We have a motion. Do we have any questions? Second. Okay. Get a second. I did not get a second. I'll second. Jeff is second. I, I just uh how is their feeling about it? I know we've talked about this like in finance committee, but I don't know if the whole board has really heard much about it. What was their overall feeling that this was kind of brought to them to try to write some where people are placed and some things like that? What was their overall view of that? Yeah, I mean, I think they were excited that we brought this opportunity to them. Um, you know, through, throughout this, I think we can all agree that back page for our local to contracts has a lot of job descriptions on there. Um, and so when we brought it to them, they, they agreed with that piece of it. Um, like anything, people you know will feel that if they're doing similar jobs, that they should have been moved to based, but it was completely based on job title. And we kind of made it clear that we're, this is where we're starting because it's the easiest place to start as, as we continue to um, you know, take job descriptions out of there. Other people will be evaluated moving forward as well through a pretty interactive process. So um, as we got that information out and they kind of started going to the union students that we had interacted with throughout the entire process, um, they really kind of helped bring some of the others who maybe felt a little slighted through it um, along. Of the, this isn't the end of this. This is the start of this as we continue to condense that back page of our contract. We brought it to them, yeah. correct? Okay, right. so 41 years, I've never seen history bring something to somebody else who's going to have some financial benefit at least that i'm aware of like this so i just want to commend i think it just really creates a sense of goodwill that we want to do do the right things even though we may don't have, maybe don't have to we could have waited to the end of the year and i just commend who you know whoever was involved with all that because i just think it's great and 
Oftentimes parents, you know, when they come, they do their work, they're busy outside of their jobs, and sometimes they don't feel how, like they have a lot of say or, uh, or authority to get those things done. So it's just really such a good will gesture, I think, on the part to show how important they are to us, and also that we want to make sure you're compensated accordingly to the job that you do. My description. So thank you for all of you that were part of that. Corey. Thanks, Corey. So we still need a vote on that. All in favor say aye. 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 Again, same sign. Motion passes. Okay, um, Corey's staying up there, which tells me there's still more to go. So we're moving on to the Clam Wolf Ridge MOU regarding the multi-day overnight field trip to Wolf Ridge. Um, you have it in the board book. Are there any questions about the MOU for Wolf Ridge? Of course, this is the field trip we take for the weekend. We're asking our staff to take their weekend away from their family, to be with kids around the clock, to do the trip. And so this is just regarding their stipends. And at sunset, if this is just for this year, right. correct? Yep. Okay. In my understanding, we added $400 to each of the positions. Is that correct? Yes. And it also formalized a little bit. Uh, they had been paid stipends before, uh, but we didn't have a very large record to figure out how it came about. So this also formalizes the fact that we put something in place that um, we're all aware of who's, who's getting paid what. <laughs> so contractually, we just like our contract to state what is it in like what we actually do. So yeah. it's good to have this because I think there was some discussion. We didn't know it because we didn't have a written right. aspect of that. So our practice needs to follow and our contracts need to follow our practice. So it's good to see that. It's coming to play. All right. So we'll need a motion and a second to accept the Wolfridge MOU. I'll make a motion to approve the Wolfridge MOU. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Against, same sign. That motion passes. The next order of business is um, we'd like to set a, more, a March board work session. <clears throat> um, and as we were thinking, uh, the, the mon uh, Monday, I don't remember the date already. Do you remember? March 11th. March 11th. Um, because Mondays seem to work for most folks on the board and uh, the timing with when the actual board meeting is and such. So if you would please look at your calendars. What time? Sure what time? That I won't be here. I start. Oh, wait, I will be here. I'm sorry. Wait, no, I won't be here. We're thinking that. Oh, you won't be here. So, Jeff? I'm not bad. I'm on a trip to the When? So what's the period of time that you're gone? I'm gone the 29th through the 18th. I wasn't aware of how much. So. So that takes us just almost up until the next board meeting. Um, the next board meeting is the 21st. So you choose to do it now. Have a suggestion? Can dial you in? Um, well, maybe we move ahead and tentatively set the date anyway, because otherwise we're looking at... The 19th would be my first if you decide to. And the board meeting is two days later. So it would either have to be before you go, which would put us at next week. So, yeah, that time is going to work. So... You have Monday the 26th. But we are really done. Yeah. So okay. you can go ahead and set it. Okay. Or what was your original date? March 11th, Monday, March 11th. Okay. All right. So looks like we're going to set it for Monday, March 11th. Um, what time? I will be flying back. I, I Sure, but I think we're back by noon because we're dropping my kid off at college is moving back. Um, so half the noon would be safer. <laughs> well, I start practice. Oh, oh practice. So okay, how about Tuesday the twelfth? Any time we're back. Morning is a better for me. 
because I know you, you have to run your business. <laughs> so like eight earlier, seven? What time do I actually I don't care either way. Seven will be great for me, but I don't want to make you guys get out of it. Okay, so <laughs> oh, I'm already, I'm already yeah. on. Yeah. Okay. okay, so we're going to go ahead and set it for Tuesday the 12th at 7 a.m. Um, Jeno's in it. <laughs> And so we'll need a motion and a second to accept that date. We have a motion. We have a motion. We have a second. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Again, same sign. The motion passes. How long do you want the board room reserved for? Uh, Four hours? Okay. Yeah, I mean, reserved for the morning. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So is there any other business before we move on to adjourn? Okay, then we need a motion and a second to adjourn. I will so move that we adjourn this meeting. We have a motion. Okay. Josh, second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Against, same sign. Meeting is adjourned. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for being here, David.